This is the racial bias and black speech round table. So first I'd like to thank uh, Mozilla for supporting this work. I'd also like to express my immense gratitude to Christina Daniels and to Pioneer Works for hosting and supporting this roundtable and workshop later today. I'd like to thank the panelists and workshop facilitators. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. As uh, one Sean Carter once said, you could have been anywhere else in the world, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. Um, my name is Johan Diedrich. I'm an artist, engineer, and musician making performances, installations, and sculptural objects for encountering the world through listening. I surface vibrations embedded in space and material, peeling back sonic layers to reveal hidden stories and untold memories. I share my work with others through listening tours, workshops, and open source hardware and software. Also just mentioned I was a past technology resident here at Pioneer Works last spring of 2020. So it's good to be back here in person. Uh, I was doing that mostly virtually. So I'm currently speaking to you from the historic land of Lenape Hoking, uh, stewarded by the Lenape people before settler colonizers came from Europe and forcibly displaced these people from the land. In particular, this marshland area by the waterfront that we're sitting at right now was known as Sassian before Dutch coloni colonizers renamed the area Road Hoek. Uh, because of the rich red color of the soil. English colonizers kept the name, which then became what we now know as Red Hook, which is where we are today. The work we do here today honors the legacy of the Lenape people and explicitly works to dismantle settler colonialism and white supremacy. We have a long way to go, and my intention with this work is to proactively push forward an anti-racist agenda into the world. So thank you all again for joining me here and engaging with this work. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, my parents got an Alexa device in their home. My parents began interacting with the device, asking it trivial factoid questions like, how tall is Mount Everest? Or who is the richest person in the world? Requesting it to play music or put on the local basketball game. Both of my parents emigrated from Jamaica to South Florida in the late 1980s, and especially my father carry a strong accented English brought over from the Caribbean. The device has difficulty parsing their requests, so when they asked Alexa to play Bob Marley or to watch the Heat vs. Warriors, a confused Alexa either responds with the wrong action or simply says, I didn't get that. So starts a circuitous journey where my parents each try on different voices in order to get Alexa to understand what they mean. They try various combinations, slowing the cadence of their speech, enunciating more clearly, and emphasizing on different parts of words in order to get it just right for Alexa to understand their request. Overhearing this vocal dance, it reminded me the way in which my parents would adopt new voices depending on who they were talking with. This would happen mostly with white Americans in contexts that range from ordering food at a restaurant, talking on the phone with coworkers, handling business at a bank, and other types of situations where their form of speech became a communication impediment and they were forced to modulate their voice in order to be understood. This code switching is normal for most black Americans who have one way of speaking with their family, friends, and community, and another way of speaking when interfacing with non-black ears in situations like presenting their ideas in classrooms, applying for jobs, requesting a bank loan, speaking with a police officer. It was then I realized that previously black Americans had to code switch for white ears and now what I was experiencing was black Americans now code switching for AI ears. This insight led me to what has become Dark Matters, an investigation into the conditions that make voice interface technologies unable to recognize black English speech as well as other kinds of accented English and dialects from the global black diaspora. A 2020 study by researchers at Stanford University found that most commercially available voice interface and speech recognition systems were disproportionately less accurate in recognizing black English speech versus white English speech. To quote Monica Chin from The Verge, the researchers use voice recognition tools from Apple, Amazon, Google, IBM, and Microsoft to transcribe interviews with, 20, with 42 white people and 73 black people, all of which took place in the US. The tools misidentified words about 19% of the time during the interviews with white people 
and 35% of the time during the interviews with black people. The system found 2% of audio snippets from white people to be unreadable compared to 20% of those from black people. The errors were particularly large for black men with an error rate of 41% compared to 30% for black women. The researchers attributed the bias of both a lack of black speech data used to train these systems, as well as the underlying acoustic model used to recognize speech itself. As a midway point to this project, I sought out researchers, technologists, artists, and critical design thinkers to help both unpack this topic and to create a non-prescriptive, anti-techno-solutionist venue to think openly about how we might speculate on just technological features. As Romy Ron Morrison writes in Gaps Between the Digits on the Flesh Unknowns of the Human, on the topic of fleshy unknowability, correcting machine bias and algorithmic violence is more than a question of technical fixes and morality training. To these ends, I'm delighted to introduce today's panelists to talk about racial bias and speech technology. Dr. Jennifer Lynn Stover, in her book, The Sonic Color Line, rigorously unpacks the history of racialized listening practice and how black vocalization has been constructed and disciplined beginning in the antebellum South to the present day. Kola Tubison's work in language preservation and speech recognition technology has helped diversify the field while highlighting the problems of this of its future outcomes, with one news article suggesting if Nigerians end up sounding like Americans, we can probably blame voice assistants. And James Alistair Sprang has demonstrated through his work turning towards a radical listening. While there might be poetic possibility in the kinds of mistranslation that happens between black voice and machine listening, what will happen to black voices when they are translated and transcribed, filtered and flattened through these systems? What is the history of the relationship between racial bias and black speech? How are these systems already in our daily lives? How are these systems related to other voice technologies we might already be familiar with? What are the poetic possibilities and how might they be changing the nature of black speech in ways we might not be aware of? So with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist who will introduce their work for about 15 minutes. Afterwards, I'll introduce the next panelists before their own presentations. Without further ado, um, Dr. Jennifer Lynn Stover. Um, Jennifer Lynn Stover received her PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity from USC. Her dissertation, The Contours of the Sonic Color Line, Slavery, Segregation, and the Cultural Politics of Listening, was a 2007 finalist for the American Studies Association Dissertation Prize. She serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Popular Music Studies, Sound Studies, and Social Text. She has published in Social Text, Social Identities, Sound Effects, American Quarterly, and Radical History Review, among others. Most recently, her article, Fine Tuning the Sonic Color Line, Radio and the Acousmatic Du Bois, was published in Modernist Cultures and is featured for the online version of the issue. During 2011 to 2012, she was a fellow at the Society of the Humanities at Cornell University, participating in the research group on sound, culture, theory, and politics. Currently an associate professor at SUNY Binghamton, Jennifer teaches courses on African American literature, sound studies, race and gender representation, and popular music. She is also the project coordinator for the uh, Binghamton Historical Soundwalk Project, a multi-year archival, civically engaged art project designed to challenge how Binghamton students and year-round residents hear their own town themselves and each other. She's also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Sounding Out, the Sound Studies blog, fantastic blog, check it out. And her book, The Sound of Color Line, Race and the Cultural Politics of Listening, was published by New York University in 2016. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, thank you so much. Okay. All right, my first slide is up. Welcome everyone to this important conversation. A special thank you to Johan for asking me to be a part of it. Um, and for all of us to bring, bring all of us here together today. Um, my role today is to provide some useful terminology, historical context, and theory to frame our conversation, that it's useful to understand how sonic racism is embedded so deeply into speech AI. And um, my title for this, this short talk is, was prompted by this tweet from Ikechuku Onowene, who was talking about his experience very similar 
to what Johan's describing with his parents. He was on IG Live. A friend told their Google um, home to start playing a song. It turned his on, but then when he tried to shut it off, his own Google home could not hear um, his voice. He's curator at the Hammer Museum and for, um, formerly of the kitchen here in New York. So I am bringing a couple terms to our conversation today. The sonic color line and the listening ear. The sonic color line from his, the sonic color line is real. Um, it's how our ideologies of race and white supremacist thought are developed through sound and how we think race through sound, experience it through sound and listening. The listening ear is a bodily technology. It's how our listening practices are disciplined by white supremacy and white supremacist ideas of sound. What is a proper voice? What is the right tone? What is the appropriate cadence for certain situations? And how we are all um, impacted by that. Um, this, these are some, I'm not gonna go through all of these at, at all, but Johan brought up this study from Stanford and I just wanted you to have some visualizations of precisely the level of inaccuracies that we are dealing with. And here, this is from um, the top five, the study from Stanford with linguists, and I think it's important that it's computer engineers and linguists together. Um, Apple, IBM, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, WER is word error ratio. So you can see how much higher the word error ratio was for black speakers using AI versus white speakers. A dramatic difference. The second table shows um, confusion, they call it perplexity when the Alexa or whatever can't figure out what you're saying. How much higher the perplexity is for speakers of African American vernacular English using the grammatical structures of that idiom. So he a pasture versus he's a pasture, the perplexity was much higher from the, just, just with, without that um, quote unquote standard English grammar, how much harder it is for the AI to understand. Or I should say how much it's made harder for the AI to understand. And the bottom table is when they use identical phrases. So, you know, small things like, I see a dog, and they had it, the white speakers, black speakers. Just with sound alone, how much higher the word error ratio is with exactly the same grammar, same phrasing, same words. So they're suggesting that the errors are in, actually higher in terms of sound and acoustics, things like rhythm, um, Johan mentioned cadence, and that's going to be important. Pitch, syllable, vowel length, all of these non or extralingual cues that we use to communicate with each other. Um, so the stakes of this conversation, um, AI speech is used in my brief research on this, you know, the last few weeks. It's used everywhere in places we don't know. It's not just our assistants and our mobile devices, hands-free computing. It's an automatic translation and subtitling. It's how people now use um, translation to put um, archival uh, transcripts, digital dictation for completing medical records, voice analysis for job interviews and job kind of uh, you know check-ins, automatic transcriptions of court proceedings. There are all of these areas that range from the mundane to the very, very life-altering that use, uses AI um, and are subject to these kinds of errors. This is another great book to check out, Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Umoja Noble, and she's looking at search engines and Google and why certain searches come to the top. And you kind of see her examples there. Um, but it's important I want to bring in you know, her thoughts here about discrimination being embedded in computer code. That computer code isn't neutral, our technologies aren't neutral, they come out of specific cultural context. And increasingly we rely on them by choice or not. Most of us don't know often when something we say is being monitored by AR and shunted in particular directions. Um, and she believes that artificial intelligence will become a major human rights issue in the 21st century. The UN agrees. They have a paper that they put out in December of 2020 called Bias, Racism, and Lies, Facing Up to the Unwanted Consequences of AI. And they have a video about it that is actually, for me, it was pretty, pretty, pretty terrifying, especially when one of the quotes was like, doing the right thing is not always good for business, which was terrifying. <laughs> Um, so, and she also says, and this is going to become key, I could see the connection between search results 
and the tropes of African Americans that are as old and endemic to the United States as the history of the country itself. And she looks specifically at stereotypes about black women in her book. And it reminded me of the journey that I took in terms of researching sound and where do stereotypical ideas created by white listeners about black speech and sound, where are they rooted? And that's what took me in my book back, back, back to the, the 19th and even the 18th centuries. Um, so to sum up here, right, machine listening is designed predominantly by white males, um, white male based US listeners and speakers and they've coded their biases, desires, preferences into AI, claiming it to be a universal technological tool that we all can access. And that's part of the danger of it, is that idea that it's, it's innocent or colorblind or neutral. If you come from a different speech community, AI is going to discipline your speech in some fashion, or you're not gonna be able to access the benefits of it, and you may very likely experience harm because of it. Um, so now that I've introduced this concept, I'm going to finish up here by giving you three different historical moments where race and racism was an active part of producing auditory technology. And that sonic racism has been embedded in all of our sound reproduction technology from before um, it was part of the ground and the, the cultural milieu out of which it came um, from the very beginning. So in this first section, um, old and endemic to the United States, um, I want to show you, and I may need to move out of your way. Hopefully you can see these. These are um, ads that white enslavers paid to have published in newspapers attesting to the escape of an enslaved person. These are from UNC Greenboro's online database, the Digital Library on American Slavery. And I have sifted through hundreds of these looking for descriptions of sound. And not surprisingly to me, it was everywhere. And so much of our conversation in the US about race has focused on vision to the detriment of sonic racism kind of sneaking by and evading legal detection in terms of redress. And you see that descriptions of enslaved people's voices were cited often as being distinct. Um, this is where those ideas about vocal tone and racial difference as being lodged in the voice and the body begin to come from. As far back as the 1700s, the first mention of hoarse voice, which is one of the top descriptions that appears over and over again, is actually in 1787, right around the time of the Constitution was being written. The first mention of a fine voice was in 1783, and there's a sharp increase in descriptions of voice in the 1830s and 1840s, both signaling the kind of falling apart and the increasing amounts of self-liberation by enslaved peoples, but also white enslavers' desire to fix race beyond vision. Um, if you cannot tell who is white and who is black by sight, well, you can, you can hear it. And this is the beginning of the birth of the sonic color line. You see their manly voice? That was a description in this particular ad of a enslaved woman who escaped. So you also see the kind of masculinizing of black women's voices in this moment, along with fine voice and a lot of the feminizing also of, of black men. And the frequency of, of these ads suggests both how many people freed themselves, but also that white people began perceiving around the, around the country um, a rather blunt difference between the timbre of white voices and black voices. But it doesn't just name a black voice, it norms white voices, right? If, if black voices are all of these things, white voice is just the voice. It is a myriad of, of tones and cadences. It is anything that these voices are not. This is one of the earliest forms of sound recording technology. Before we had recorders, we had words, and we had specific words that were circulated in mass media, people read them, shaped how they listened and how they heard, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So these ideas began to be reinforced by things like eye dialect, racist writing, um, and, and transcription in novels, sheet music, and newspapers. These stereotypes were used to justify chattel slavery and afterwards Jim Crow. Um, so white men created sound technologies by and for themselves. Um, it was, it was created out of the desire to record last words, 
you know, pass on legacies, wills, dictation in office spaces. It wasn't initially created to circulate music. Technology comes from desire. It doesn't dictate historical change. Desire for, for change kind of shapes and brings about technology. And so early in sound recording, again, created by white men for themselves and their needs and wants, they still needed an imagining of a black voice to do it. And embedded in these very first test pressings, these, there were two there, but I had to translate it. I'm being foiled. Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison used the same phrase to test their equipment. And we'll see if you can pick it out. Um, I tried to find the ones that were the least altered by modern technology. Um, if you could play the one on the bottom. I don't think the one on the top came through. Oh, maybe. in her new book, Sound Recording, what is it called? Sound Recording, Technology in American Literature from the Phonograph to the Remix. She talks about how people had to be trained to hear the machine. Like that wasn't obvious as speech. And so they had these tone tests where they would help people learn to pick out a voice. Kind of like the opposite of AI where we're trying to teach it to listen to us. They trained us to try to listen to these machines. And in the development of the diaphragms for these machines, test phrases were spoken over and over so the machine could repeat them. These actually have the same test phrases in there. And some people may know this, what the first phrase was, was Mary had a little lamb. It was the recitation of Mary had a little lamb as a test phrase for it. So Teague says this story is so banal that people don't even question it anymore. And they kind of treat it like a cutesy tidbit, like, oh, this big serious thing, this technology had a nursery rhyme at the beginning of it. And, but I began to kind of dig into it, right? She says, here again, the choice of Mary had a little lamb and other familiar phrases and songs were not arbitrary. The cadence of the nursery rhyme, along with its cultural ubiquity, meant that audiences would be able to hear and understand the words transmitted by the phonograph because they'd heard them before. So it was relying on cultural ubiquity, right? And of course, the question, whose culture? How did this come to be? Mary Had a Little Lamb was written in 1830 by, could you click the next one? A woman named, well, it's debatable. I won't even go into that. She plagiarized it, apparently. A woman named Sarah Hale um, in Boston in 1830, so pre-Civil War. Um, she wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb, particularly quote, to all good children in the United States, again, in 1830, who is she speaking to in Boston schools? She wrote it to please and instruct you. I know children love to read rhymes and sing little verses, but they often read silly rhymes, and such manner of spending their time is not good. I intended when I began to write this book to furnish you with a few pretty songs of poems that would teach you truths, and I hope induce you to love truth and goodness. Children who love their parents and their home can soon teach their hearts to love their God and their country. So Americanism, whiteness, Christianity kind of built into Mary Had a Little Lamb. But that's not all. When it hit Boston schools, the song that came with the book, people hated it. It was too complicated. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. So the cadence that we actually know Mary had a little lamb from that we can probably all sing, and I can actually in your head right now to imagine it, comes from a minstrel song um, written by E.P. Christie in the 1840s. It's the verse that's called Merrily We Roll Along in the song Good Night Ladies, which started out as farewell ladies. So a minstrel song written by white men to perform in blackface was the test pattern to use in the very first recording technologies. He made a lot of money off it, very rich in New York, actually committed suicide two years into the Civil War because he saw his revenue stream drying up and he's buried here in the Greenwood Cemetery. Oh. Um, okay, I know I need to go, but I just wanted to show you You're good. one more, okay that this idea that technology is neutral, that it just records neutral things, that it's not shaped by um, cultural ideas, 
also is in you know, microphone technology, which we have microphone technology as part of AI. And I wanted to share in the 40s at the height of radio that a lot of people in the radio industry thought that microphones were colorblind. Norman Corwin was a very famous radio writer, producer, some of the most famous pieces in the 40s. The height of de jure and de facto segregation was also the quote golden age of radio. There were few, fewer black voices on air in the 40s than before or since, but yet that is kind of held up as the, the golden age of radio. And he says, and this sounds a lot like, if you read articles, uh, people who run as computer engineering labs who make AI. He says, I have found too few, and this is the word that was the, the parlance of the 40s, the polite parlance, this is actually in Negro Digest. I have found too few Negroes who have taken an interest in radio. I suspect it's because they don't know about it. 90% um, of Americans had radio. 87% of black Americans had radio by the 40s. So they're again shunting it onto, oh, it's a pipeline problem. You can't discriminate against people with a microphone. We can't see through the microphone. Race is only visual. What colorblindness often meant was that white men could minstrelize black sound on the radio. This is a picture of uh, the two actors who played Amos and Andy, Charles Carell and Freeman Godson. You see there some of that eye dialect I was talking about and how it's scripted into what they were doing. These are famous black radio actors that many of us don't know. Um, their roles were also scripted too. And white voices had a gamut of representations of sound, of cadence, of all of that on the radio. Whereas black actors were limited to very small roles, often as servants or comedians. And all of these folks talk about having to be, quote, taught Negro dialect, right? Back to that imagined sound that white Americans, that listening ear teaches them to imagine black speech to be like. So very limiting um, on that regard. Wonderful Smith, who was on the Red Skeleton show, which was kind of like Saturday Night Live. It was a bunch of comedy sketches. He was actually fired from the show because his voice wasn't readily apparent to white listeners as a black voice. So this colorblind right, microphone um, was problematic. And so unless black listeners were made to sound a certain way so white listeners could identify them, thus sonifying race, they were, they were made invisible by it. Um, last thing. So three takeaways. Um, race is sonic. We are trained to hear race through white supremacist frames. If you put racism into something, you will get racism out of it, right? It's, it, these things aren't neutral. And then the stakes and consequences of speech and AI are systemic and profound. We don't just need more diverse data sets, although we do desperately. We need a complete transformation of the industry and who's designing it and the transparency in how we all engage with it. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I have so many questions to ask, but um, I think we'll, try, we'll go to Colonex and see if they're... Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kola Tubosu. I'm here to make a short presentation on bias in African language and technology. Um, I'm a linguist. I've worked uh, in linguistics for over a decade. And this presentation comes from the challenges I've had, the um, observed and lived experiences of my work and experience in African languages and technology. Let me start with the background. Um, for my work, I live in Nigeria, which is a multilingual country. It has about 500 languages, but it's 190 million people. Um, we have three major languages, Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba, each having more than 100 million speakers in Nigeria and around the world. Yoruba is spoken uh, outside of Nigeria in Benin, Togo, Ghana, sometimes also in Cuba and Brazil, and in the Americas. In Nigeria, we also speak Nigerian Pidgin, which is a kind of Creole that has developed over the years, a combination of Nigerian English and local languages. And then we have Nigerian English, which is a different language, which is spoken mostly in Nigeria. It's different from British and American English in terms of accents and uh, lexicon. In 2010, of January, January 2010, Oxford English Dictionary added about 29 new Nigerian English words 
to the dictionary. So as a linguist and a tech enthusiast, uh, much of my work has been in language advocacy, language documentation, lexicography, language technology. And I got into this because of my um, experience with technology, using technology, but also because of what I've observed in the space and the limitations that, are, um, that tech has placed on uh, languages spoken in Nigeria. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of these in a bit. My experience with Twitter, Google, I worked at Google for a bit. Uh, Microsoft and others have let me on in for a bigger space for African languages and technology. So uh, until 2017, for instance, we didn't have a uh, Google voice that could speak in an African language. And even to now, we don't have one that could speak in a real African language. We have a Nigerian Google voice that speaks in Nigerian English, which means that you can use your Mac and your phones in a Nigerian English accent. I can demonstrate uh, one of them for you here. Who is the president of Nigeria? Who is the president of Nigeria? Sorry, like I don't have the home address yet, but I will remember if you tell me. Forget about it not getting the answer correctly, but get the accent it's speaking here. Uh, it's something um, that we worked on, which um, now powers Google Assistant and Google Maps. Um, and other Google Voice products that can finally now uh, um, pronounce words and, and names of places in a Nigerian accent. How far is it to get to Ibadan? If you drive, Ibadan is 147 kilometers away. So that is a Nigerian English accent, which we again did in 2017. Before then, um, there haven't been anything that focused on Nigerian African languages. Even to now, there are no Google products in specifically in, uh, in Nigerian or African language. So in 2005, I founded Yorubanim.com, which is a dictionary, a multimedia dictionary of Yoruba names. Later, I did the TTS Yoruba, which is a text to speech application for Yoruba, also the first text to speech application. Now, um, how did I get here? Like I said, um, my experience brought me here. First, in uh, early 2000 when I went to the university and I got my first computer, I realized that I couldn't put tone marks on Yoruba words. Now, for those who don't understand, tone marks are these marks that you find on these um, um, wor words and letters that make them, that enhance them, that make them um, different from English. So if you write any of these expressions without any of those marks above and under it, which you call diacritics, you would totally confuse the reader. Um, so the first one is pronounced Oko, second one Oko, third one Oko, fourth one Oko, next one Oko, last one Oko. For those who don't speak Yoruba, you might not know the difference between any of these, um, but Yoruba is a tonal language and these differences are remarkable and they can change the meaning of a word. In writing, the compromises were made to have this diacritics applied to tell the reader what word is being said. Um, so you find many instances like this in Yoruba. Look at the second column as well. Igba, 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 Igba. And the last one, Owo, Owo, Owo. Um, so I realized I couldn't write this. Why? Because the technology that powered Google, uh, Microsoft Word at the time came from America and they cared only for those writing in English and eventually maybe French and then maybe some other European languages. And I have noticed this trend in most of the work that tech has done where Languages that are not the big hegemonic languages don't get the care that they need to be able to write properly. So we have to invent this tone marking software, which we put out for free for those who want to write in Yoruba. And many African languages so far not having the tools to be able to write this. Um, so not being able to do that part, you know, pushed me uh, into the space and um, to find a solution for that. Um, there are other issues in African languages. Uh, we'll run through them. Google Translate, as you know, um, is very efficient with languages like French, German, et cetera. But when you try with an African language, you're likely going to get a terrible result. And the reason why, first, Africans don't write online. And why? Because these tech companies, like I said, didn't pay attention enough to allow people to write online. And because you don't have enough writings online, there's not enough uh, of the corpus that big tech can use to then create um, to then power the, the, the transition engine. So it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. It's a big loop, a uh, big problematic loop um, that exists. Um, and so the 
the result you find when you try to write um, things in Google Translate is usually not accurate. Um, and the, the big tech companies aren't, aren't paying enough attention uh, in terms of cost and, and fund to be able to uh, make that work. Voice technologies are often, like I mentioned earlier, reflected British American accent. The Nigerian language voice was one example um, of where that has be begun to change. Unicode Consortium, which is in, involved with the writing of language on the internet, has not been helpful for many African languages, especially Yoruba. I have a big uh, write-up about this in some other space. Uh, and they basic, basically what, it, what, what, what the complaint is that because Yoruba has marks on top and under the vowels, um, we need, we need um, sometimes pre-composed letters, characters, where the vowel already has them diacritic, diacritic on top and underneath without us having to first write the vowel and then put the dot on them and then put the mark on top, which slows you down. Um, and then again, voice assistance don't exist in African language. I'm going to give an example of this uh, in a little bit. Um, Siri is a very good example where um, the voice that powers Apple products, um, artificial intelligent voice, exists in many world languages like German, Swiss, uh, German, Swiss German, German German, Austrian German, Hebrew, Italian, etc. One day I was scrolling through and I did a screenshot, find looking for different ways in which they exist, even in different variants of English. But it doesn't exist in any African language. Why is that? Is it because we don't have the numbers? No. Yoruba is spoken by over 30 million people. Igbo is spoken by over 30 million people. Hausa is spoken by over 50 million people. Swedish is spoken by 10 million people, Norwegian by 5.3 million people, and Danish by 5.6. All of them 23 million speakers, not as many as Yoruba, as you can see. So it's not the language, it's not the population. Um, there, there has to be other ways to, to account for the fact that, um, you know, tech companies are not paying attention enough to African languages enough to provide products for them that they think would empower people to be able to use technology. So what is it? Is it money? Africans spend money on the internet, they, they use the computers. Africans are already on the internet and they use devices like app, uh, Apple, Apple's iPad and iPhones. Um, is it attitude? Are there Africans who just feel that they can't use the device in their language? There are people like us who choose, who want to use the device in our language and who will use it if it exists. Um, but why are big tech not paying attention to this? Again, um, content, look at the internet, um, you know, if we remove English, see how many languages exist there. None of them is an African language. Look at the other, where I assume African languages would be still not as big as Russian. So this probably explains why many people pay attention to many of these languages other than uh, African languages. Part of my work is to make sure that the internet is comfortable, conducive for African languages to thrive. And I'm creating products and projects to make sure we can have as many African languages in that space as possible. Um, but my work is just one person. There are several um, other people doing similar things in different spaces. But we also need big tech to also uh, pay attention at least to big languages that are not the big usual ones that we know, but have equally uh, important and you know uh, nutrients uh, people who might want to use them um, if the opportunities exist. I always point to my grandfather who, uh, before he died, could speak and write in Yoruba. Um, but couldn't write in English, which means that if you give him a mobile phone, if you text him in Yoruba, he would read it only if he could get to where the message was. Every other prompt there is in English and it's really hard for him to find um, like that. So why does this inclusion matter? Uh, for many African languages, for many Africans who use mobile phones, but don't speak English or French or Portuguese, how would they be able to use these things? Uh, we say the internet has opportunities for everyone. But if we don't create uh, the spaces for these opportunities to manifest, uh, especially through the language option, um, nothing would happen. I speak about most ATM in machines in Nigeria not having language options other than English. Until recently, when one or two ATMs now include uh, Yoruba or Igbo Hausa options for you to use ATM. But even then, when you use them, the languages are not uh, simple to use. And we already assume that many people can, who can speak Yoruba can also read it which is not the case. So we need more tech solutions that can speak, that can do other ways to engage with people other than you know, writing and speaking. And if people don't trust the machine, then they won't put their money in the bank. And therefore, the language barrier becomes another barrier in the financial inclusion. Um, again, Nigerian English voice as a 
pointed out earlier, people who use the British and American voice at the time could not, you know, many Uber drivers didn't understand how the machine was pronouncing the Nigerian names that they knew and were familiar with. And so they get confused when they hear the British or American accent directing them to a certain place. Now they have a Nigerian English voice that they can use. Uh, so we need more local work, uh, things like that. Google is one example, and there are many others uh, that can do the same. Google Pixel, for instance, has an automatic translation for recordings. But if you speak in an accent that is not the typical American accent, it would not transcribe many of the things you're saying. So for me, when I'm using it, I'm conscious that the person listening, listening in, in quotes, is not in Nigeria. So I have to speak in an effective uh, American accent before I can get uh, good products. And that shows that we still have a long way to go. Uh, there are many accents out there in Nigeria and Africa. Many of us speak English. We've spoken English since uh, over, you know, uh, how many hundred years during British colonization. We need to also have tech solutions that help and adapt to our, uh, our way of life. Technology is a blank canvas. It shouldn't have, uh, it shouldn't have to reflect only one culture. It's a big space. And we should be able to populate it and fill it with things that reflect our culture and that reflect our way of life and that empower us actually to be able to do the things we do every day, um, you know, with uh, our own lives. Um, English is great, it's a unifier, it's, it connects people around the world, but there are several millions of people who don't speak English, many who don't want to, um, and many who would be more empowered if these technologies that we think is a way to the future can uh, can 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 you know be accessible in the language they speak in the spaces uh, uh, they live. I'm a linguist. I believe that people should speak the language to their children so that they can pass it on. But that is just one way of passing the language on. Uh, as somebody who believes in language advocacy and revitalization, I believe that technology is also one big way we can use to uh, help our languages survive in the next to the next century. That is where young people spend all their time. That is where you know the, the attention is every day. If we can make that place also habitable, conducive for languages to thrive, African languages, then we also help the language move to the next century. And that is the purpose of my work. Um, and that's also the purpose of my advocacy, especially with big tech and many other people around. So um, like I said, uh, big tech needs to do something. We also need to do ours. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I will take your questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, and we'll come, we'll come back uh, with Kula afterwards and have a conversation with him. You can ask questions. Um, great. And then so next up, uh, we have uh, James Alistair Sprang. James Alistair Sprang's works exists in gallery spaces theater spaces and the space generally found between the ears. He tells stories informed by black radical and experimental traditions. For the past 15 years, James has sustained a multidisciplinary practice with the understanding that storytelling is at the foundation of all disciplines. Sprang has built relationships with communities and audiences across experimental theater, sound art, conceptual art, performance art, poetry and spoken word with a multidisciplinary practice that cuts through segregated stories, timelines, archives, and imaginations. Sprang has completed several residencies both domestically and internationally. He has also shown and performed at institutions such as the Public Theater, Bereshkinov Art Center, Vox Populi, Abrams Art Center, the Apollo Theater, the Brooklyn Museum, Mockdown Theater, Pioneer Arts. Painted Bride Art Center and The Kitchen. Um, take it away, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you for the invitation so much. Uh, yeah, of course. Yes. Um, thank you for the beautiful work. Thank you. And um, <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, okay, so. Okay, I'm gonna ask your permission to tell a story really quickly. So when I say crick, can you say crack? That's you, that's you granting me permission to like ramble for 15 minutes, all right? Crick! Crack! Crick! Crack! Crick! Crack! Thank you. All right, so um, 
I'm a multidisciplinary artist has been established um, and I started this project called Turning Towards a Radical Listening in 2016. And my whole thing is I work in sound. Recording in progress. Cool, thanks. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you can't write that. You really can. Uh, I uh, I work in sound. I work in image, and I work in installation. And I try to generate experiences for people that kind of straddles arriving at a white walled gallery and arriving at a black box theater, right? Like these durational experiences that happen in gray spaces. And these gray spaces are for black and brown bodies. And they're also for considering abstraction as a way to unpack some of the ideas we've thought through today. Um, but also so many other ideas that are really difficult to articulate, to talk through, to think through. Sometimes abstraction is the ideal form of representation. Um, so, before I get started, oh, okay, so what is Turning Towards a Radical Listening? Turning Towards a Radical Listening was a 70-minute performance that premiered at The Kitchen um, and also took place at the Knockdown Center, but I'm going to mainly talk about what happened at The Kitchen, which was essentially I was there for six weeks um, and I invited poets to come and talk with me. And we talked about language as a technology. We talked about the ways in which language is coded to, isn't necessarily coded and equipped to represent the black experience. Um, and so these black poets who use language as their material talk to me about what that feels like, right? Um, and I recorded all of those conversations in a room with live audiences, and then I sampled those conversations to generate soundscapes. And I fed those soundscapes of all these beautiful black and brown voices into Google's speech API, which resulted in this nonsensical concrete poem due to everything that we just learned today, right? So before I got started, uh, there were three things kind of suspended. So, um, and I think it helped me parse through perceptual and structural bias. So I'm going to share those things with you. The first thing is Diane Deutsch. She's a brilliant, uh, brilliant person that has discovered the majority of the audio illusions that we know of today. We're all very familiar with what a visual illusion is. When we look at something and we don't necessarily see what's in front of us. She's discovered all of the audio illusions where we sit and we listen to something and we hear something that's not necessarily in the air, right? So for those of you with a pen and paper, I'd love for you to write down what you hear over the course of the next minute and a half. For those of you without, just, just sit and listen. What you're hearing is the phrase high, low, transferring from these speakers, right? Um, but over time, due to perceptual bias, your brain is going to start to generate other language, and that language is really based on where you're at right now, right? Um, so could we turn the volume down just a little bit and uh, just press next and it should play. to the next slide. So maybe let's just raise our hands. Who heard something besides high low? Okay, I'm gonna, I heard black over and over and over and over <laughs> again. Uh, would anyone else like to share what they heard? Please. I heard, at first I heard back, then I heard big, so I was like big back, and then there's like one pulsing one, and he's like, oi. 
Do you speak Spanish? Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. Um, so that's called The Phantom Illusion, discovered by Diane Deutsch. Um, the next thing that was kind of suspended in my head is this clip. Now, I'll be held in contempt if I drop this, so I'm not going to do some drama and drop it on the floor and watch it roll around. But that's cement. That is a sidewalk. And that is not an unarmed teenager with nothing but Skittles trying to get home. That was somebody who used the availability of dangerous items from his fist to the concrete to cause great bodily injury. Not that it's necessary for self-defense, but great bodily injury against George Zimmerman. And the suggestion by the state that that's not a weapon, that that can't hurt somebody, that that can't cause great bodily injury is disgusting. Wow, all right, cool. So I think we're all familiar with what this is. This is Mark O'Mara essentially arguing that concrete public space was used as a weapon against Trayvon Martin, which, which brought me some places that I'll get to in a second. And then obviously Sophia Noble's algorithms of oppression. So these three things are kind of suspended in my head as I'm trying to make a work that speaks to the black experience in America. And I realized that concrete is a technology. It is an ancient technology that is produced from aggregate taken from all over the world and bound together. I mean, it's a technology that can take the form of any mold that it's poured into. It can take on any texture. It can take on any color. It is literally the foundation for all of our institutions and paves the roads of our sedentary societies. That sounds like a good way <laughs> to talk about bias. So I realized that I wanted to use concrete not only as a material, but also as a historical analogy. Because of concrete and its nature, there's so many art movements that are called concrete this, concrete that, concrete this. Um, I honed in on concrete poetry, which is a movement coming out of Brazil in the 1950s in which the poetry is not about language arriving in succession and generating meaning, but rather how language can fall onto the page in an abstract way to generate meaning. So this is an example of a uh, Cuba grama in 1960 made by Augusto de Campos, who is kind of like the leading figure of this concrete poetry movement. I just place it there so you can see the name, so you can write it down, but also get a sense of what I'm talking about when I say concrete poetry. Like this is a concrete poem. But what I did was I coded this instrument that allowed me to take samples from poets and manipulate them in real time, slow them down, um, increase harmonics, decrease harmonics, like all these ways of manipulating sounds so that speech could become a soundscape, so that all these different ways of talking could generate this larger, this larger thing. If you press next, we're gonna hear the voice of Norbese Phillips, who just won the uh, Penn Award, which is kind of like the biggest award you can win as a poet in the world. English is my mother tongue, a mother tongue is not a foreign land, land, lang, language, languish, anguish, a foreign anguish. English is my father tongue, a father tongue is a foreign language, therefore English is a foreign language, not a mother tongue. What is my mother tongue, my mammy tongue, my mummy tongue, my momsy tongue, my molde tongue, my ma tongue. So difficult to hear, but I think it's kind of nice because it actually sort of replicates what Google Speech API is trying to do, right? <laughs> um, so can, can, we hear the, can we hear the next one, please? So I profoundly distrust it. She's talking about language, right? I profoundly distrust language. So essentially, this, this, is a, this is a photo from an early workshop in which I'm doing what I just described, right? I'm taking voices like what you just heard, I'm making, I'm making music with them, and I'm feeding it through Google's speech API. And it, it, produces, it produces something like this. So the next step was generating our own application. 
Uh, and, and it's a very simple application. We siphoned Google's speech API. We developed a skin that looked like a Google document. And on the back end, I was able to draw lines so that the language produced by the speech API would populate as though it were a concrete poem. So we're like, so it's like a predetermined structure of how the language could fall on the page, and I had absolutely no control over the language that would be produced. I think this is like a quick photo of the back end. You see, I also have access to where the sound, like what is quote unquote listening, right? Um, which in this case, for the purposes of this screenshot was the microphone in my laptop. And so this is what's produced. And if you press next, you'll hear a room full of people, maybe two times this amount, just walking around, reading excerpts from a Norbese poem, right? So if you press next, please. Okay, we're not gonna be able to hear it, but essentially this is like a room full of people speaking. Uh, again, what I was trying to simulate with this performance. What does it feel like to be black in America? <laughs> For the nerds in the room, I think this is super helpful to get an understanding of what's actually going on. So on the left-hand side, we have what I'm using on stage. Series of MIDI controllers being my instrument, that's being fed into wave field synthesis, which is a type of speaker system that allows you to choreograph sound in the room in a very real way. This is an image of it. So each of those little things is a speaker. And so I could like pause it sound in that empty chair and have that sound or that voice or that instrument move to the other side of the room. So voices are passing through you, moving around you, and you're watching as this algorithm fails to recognize your sonic experience. And then, um, you know, that's also fed into a few other speakers in the room. And then in the booth, uh, oh, I guess also this MIDI controller section is a series of algorithms that we wrote that allowed me to kind of paint with the language on the screen. Um, you'll see what that looks like later. And then in the booth, you'll see that we have four microphones in the space. Those four microphones are recording the sound that's being introduced into the room and it's leading into the computer, which is running the app that we built, and that app is being projected into the space. So I'd be here doing my thing thing, and you'd see everything happening behind me. And essentially, I have control over what microphones are hearing what, and I'm trying to write in response to what the algorithm is writing. So I'm like writing alongside this thing. And so this is what it looks like. This is me and my double-breasted kind of like, explaining <laughs> explaining the problematics of Google's speech API, which again, we've come to understand as a collective in this room. This is kind of, I played that high-low. That's how I begin the performance. And it starts, you're just looking at the words high-low and they slowly refract and break into this, into this constellation that leads into the Google document. You're seeing people look at this poem being written, like, even this last word, that was not in the room, you know? None, none of this language is really in the room. And then this is me kind of painting with the language. And then at the end, uh, I kind of print it. I print the document and we all awkwardly sit and like listen to the suddenly quiet room and the printer are just like <laughs> and I read the poem. This is me kind of reading 70 minutes of like nonsense, problematic language and kind of trying to reclaim it, trying to imbue it with the sentiments of the poets that we had just listened to. Uh, again, this is a, it's an example of what I was trying to read. Um, and eventually I printed a book, right, with uh, some photographs of literal concrete that I poured alongside these concrete poems. So we'll just quickly go through the next couple slides. And every audience member was given a small piece of paper and a small pencil, and they did what we did at the top of this, right? They wrote down what they heard. Here you have somebody kind of drawing out how they imagine the sound to be spatialized, or the paths of specific voices. 
here during that high low segment they're hearing don't I, low tide, diagnose, lump eye, don't hide, low pie, when it flies, uh, hello, high low, a mind, distrust, your blood, um, hairline, Walmart, Death Star, awoke, soft, gradient, not yours. Um, I deeply distrust language, a mind, sound, it's trust, a sonic vocabulary. I will listen, vent indeed, find a will, find or build. A real mind, unreal, mind unpeeled. I need to find Persian weed. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, this is a little indulgent, but um, I found this the other day and it, you know, it was really sweet. I wanna thank you for your open rehearsals. I was here with my friend and it blew our minds. Cliche, I know. We walked outside and screamed, truly screamed. As young artists, these experiences mean the world. Thank you for your kindness, your individual attention, and for showing us behind the scenes. This was incredible. Thanks again, Vic. Um, and ultimately, that's what the work is about. It's about the fact that listening transforms what it is that we see. And I try to make spaces for people to listen and look and become as they need be. Um, thank you. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, James. Um, so thank you to our panel. Um, we're going to open up to a bit of a round table Q&A. If anyone has any questions, um, we can take it from the panel. I have a few questions kind of get us warmed up a little bit. Um, and we have about 20 minutes or so to talk amongst each other. So, And if people in the back want to take up some seats over here, feel free to come in and be get cozy. There's only a few of us up here, so definitely take the opportunity. Um, so I, I actually wanted to start with you, um, with Jennifer. I, sure. The, the title of the project, the work Black Matters, is deeply referencing um, Simone Brown's book, Dark Matters, about um, surveillance in, in the black body and, and this alternative history of surveillance that that is hasn't accounted for the black body as being one of the main sources or main uh, origin of the surveillance as we kind of know it today. Um, the thing that I'm really struck with that is thinking about surveillance, how it begins or starts is first taking some quality of the, the body and, and making it identifiable, and giving it some kind of label that you can then measure or, or point at or talk to and using that to begin to start this process of surveillance that then becomes something that you can filter and categorize and, and then organize and classify and, and use the technology to start to, to put people in this, this bucket over here and in that bucket over here, but really kind of beginning by this identification phase. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're, in the work that you're doing, you're tracing the origins of how black speech became something that's identifiable. Yes. And I'm wondering if there's, how, pe how black people have been able to resist or evade identification and surveillance knowing that black speech is now becoming quantifiable or identifiable. Can you talk a bit more, or can you talk about the, the evasion t techniques or resistive qualities that black voice has used to, to not be surveilled and not be identified in that way? Absolutely. Um, yes, I was thinking as, like all of us, we're talking about black language practice as itself like a, a fugitive act and one that's always in, in motion and always in shift and change. And I was thinking actually about like the sonic, as I, I say in the book too, the sonic code line isn't about like a kind of accurate detection at all, right? It's about this imposition of these categories and these kind of identifiable traits. And what black language practice in the, in the, in the diaspora has done is constantly kind of moved and shifted and, and evaded those labels and you know I was thinking about actually like the complexity of what language was like 
um, for enslaved peoples coming from all over West Africa, all of the different language practices and the fact that like you have a language stripped from you and then this other language imposed on you and then all of the languages that you make in between to communicate and to communicate with each other, to communicate in various ways. And so, you know, part of the tonal practice of how AAVE works is as a part of evasion, that the tone can be used in kind of, you know, in, in certain kind of speech speech patterns in public where there's a double meaning underneath it. And if you don't know how to talk about the double meaning, you won't understand it. Frederick Douglass very famously in his narrative talks about, um, he, he kind of talks a bit about singing and enslaved people singing. And he says the meaning in the song comes out if not in the word, then in the sound. And that there's always a tension between the word as it is spoken, said, written, and what the meaning is behind it. And he talked in there about white people thinking they know what it means and interpreting slaves singing as happy because that is how they want to see it and what's you know beneficial to their practice, but also because they fail to understand the irony and the ironizing of the tones that enslaved people are using to express themselves. So they're finding ways to, I really liked, like when you were talking about reading through that and trying to find some way to access something from it and some of that feeling and, and self-making out of those words and what has been done to those words through the AI. And that really makes me think about this whole question of, of tonal and trying to find yourself in a language that is imposed on you what do you do with it and how do you do with it? One way you just keep it moving. Mm -hmm. And um, and and as we, and part in the US, black, black, black speech is American speech innovation in a lot of ways. And it's still moving and, and AI can't keep up with it. And it doesn't want to, that's part of it. Right, yeah, I, I think one of the things that I notice or think about is that <clears throat> machine listening technologies are predicated on data being discrete and fixed and unmoving, whereas black speech is fluid and dynamic and elastic and, and morphing all the time, autopoetic. Um, and so I think it, it, it almost is antithetical to machine, like machine yeah. learning as a, as a practice, as a discipline. Yeah, I was thinking about calling it the paper like Siri can't signify or something like that, because really like that's part of it is that kind of signifying practice. They can't. They can't do it. Yeah. Um, Deeper than the Turing test. <laughs> uh, uh, for James, um, I, I was really taken about this idea of auditory illusions, and I watched. I watched the documentation of radical listening performance, and you explained to the audience a bit more about optical illusions and how you have to kind of rest your eyes so that you can see that that shark in the, in the patterns and it's I was trying to do that with the high low here resting my ears and I don't even know what that really means as a as a position but just thinking about how do I rest my ears to like tap into or gain access to maybe something that I can't listen to yet but could listen to um, I, I would wanted to ask what do you think about the new about the potential for new ways of listening and new language in this space of mistranslation. What, what, what insight or what ideas in this work has, has risen up for you in thinking about new potentials there? Um, I really, I mean, there's this practice of deep listening that's founded by Pauline Oliveros and this idea of, uh, and then if you follow that trajectory further back, you end up in like, Paris and this term called furniture music, mm -hmm. which gives us ambient music and Brian Eno down the line. And I love the idea of someone making music that's supposed to function as an object in the space that is ignored or like challenged. Um, and I, you know, there's so much coded in what I just said, but uh, we, you know, deep listening, I think is a phrase that I could put out there that anyone in this room could Google and, and find a rich history of people sitting with themselves and rest, trying to be 
um, trying to take in sound and suspend their inherent bias, right? Their, their biological bias, let alone their structural bias, which leads to music being produced, language being produced, ideas being produced. And I guess in my practice, I try to sit and listen and take in and take note of all that is produced while deep listening. I think that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it sounds like in, this is a very productive space then, in, in this space of mistranslation or glitch or, or yeah. you know, the, in between the, the ones and zeros or something like that. For, is, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to be working with algorithmic bias for the rest of my career, sure, sure. but I think this is one example that points to and indexes a much larger network of problems. Sure. Um, do you think you can ask Cola a question? Are they, you want to type it actually? That might be a better idea. Or, let's see. <laughs> We're virtual and physical kind of doing this together, so. Um, oh, awesome. Should I walk over to the computer? Um, you can hear? Okay, cool. Um, hey, Cola, uh, I'm going to project and try to yell across to the, <laughs> to the microphone. Um, my question to you is, are, are you worried about the erasure of regional dialects and, and types of speaking as speech technology is becoming more ubiquitous in Nigeria? Um, I can't hear you well. I assume they're going to type it up, but I, I heard you ask if um, I'm worried about erasure of regional dialects. Um, worried is not the right answer. Um, I mean, language does what it does. Um, some languages disappear, some, some evolve into other things. Um, of course, if I could help it, if I could help prevent it, uh, if there's not a, you know, a natural progression, if it's something that consciously happening because you know we're not doing enough to make sure people who speak the language can speak it, then that would be a problem. Um, what I'm more worried about is an erasure that happens as a result of lack of access to technology. Because as you see, um, speaking a language to our children and all of that and using education, using it in literature is a good way to pass the language across. But a more important way, at least in this generation is using uh, the internet uh, of technology. Uh, which is where more young people spend all their time. So if we, if the language dies just because um, it, it, it is not able to transit from the physical into the technological, into the virtual space, then that's a problem, I think, because um, as we know, technology is going to enhance and power the next generation. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it, it's a tragedy if we let that happen because of that. But if, um, you know, if it's just language endangerment on, uh, as a result of things we can't help, then that's a problem. That's a, that's that's probably different, uh, a different way, a diff something we can at least say, well, it's inevitable. But if we can change it, if we can find a way to help languages survive and thrive, then I think we should do everything we can. Um, any questions from the audience? Anyone um, like to ask anything to our panelists? Um, do the panelists have any questions for each other? Or, uh, coming up towards the end of the round table, so. <laughs> sure, go ahead. I'm curious, just because I've, I haven't been here for the whole presentation, but I'm curious because um, the talk about dialects of your guys' thoughts on the sort of differentiation between a dialect and a language and what that implies. Um, or sort of, like, does, does that make sense? <laughs> What's the difference between language and a dialect? Um, you know, uh, I've heard I've heard people say a, a language is a dialect with an army. It's very doctored. Um, <laughs> um, but usually, I think uh, 
dialects are just different ways of speaking the language. So if a community is founded in this space and um, everybody speaks in this way, over time, there are people on the, on the margins that will start using the language a different way, either because they're too far from the center or because of one person's particular speech defects that get transmitted and then becomes recognizable, or because of a peculiar uh, historical thing that has happened to that particular space where you know, it affects the way they then express the language. So dialects are just a part of a language. So English language in the UK, for instance, has the Cockney accent. Uh, well, well, accents and dialect, well, I don't want to go into that. I mean, it's, a, it's also a different thing. They're similar in some ways, they're different in some ways. Um, but dialects are just ways of different people who speak the same language expressing themselves. Over time, sometimes dialects then become a language of their own. So if the difference keeps expanding, uh, in linguistics, we do this cognate um, study where we look at how many, how much similarity you have between two uh, separate languages. If you have over 70%, assume that they're the same language and dialect of each other. If the difference uh, becomes you know, wider than that, then you know that they're two different languages and sometimes they're not mutually intelligible. So in a dialect, um, a dialect of a language, both, both sides can understand each other with you know, different ways of speaking. Um, when they go too far apart, they become totally different languages. And this can happen as a result of so many things, wars, separation, you know, maybe uh, you have a, a rift and the land just separates and there's no contact between them and, and migration and a number of other things like that. I hope you're very Yeah, I have a question. Sure. <clears throat> I would add that I think like African-American vernacular English is on the very, there's a, like a liminal, like a, a gray area between language and dialect where AAVE works because it has its own grammatical practices. It shares a lot of the same words, but the, the vocabulary can be different. But that tonal difference we were talking about is really important to understanding and also grammatical structure. And that language is a, or language is a dialect with an army is very accurate in the sense that like the power differential between mm -hmm. like standardized English that's taught in schools um, as the way to speak versus kind of that and that is an act of erasure for african-american vernacular english and any like some of y'all probably remember the the 90s when oakland city school district was working to um, have a curriculum that acknowledged african-american vernacular english as a, a language and to affirm it as a language with you know speakers and its own and if this i mean linguists have talked about this as a language since the 19th century so the idea that AAVE is its own language slash dialect has been around for, for years and years and years, but it keeps getting undermined by the sonic color line as incorrect, improper, ignorant, not the way to speak English. And so that denigration is actually what keeps it, you know, in, in that zone, that kind of power differential. But that was what, you know, called the quote unquote Ebonics and the political uproar from conservatives, et cetera. Um, have really undermined that. So a lot of it is in the way we teach it and affirm it or don't affirm it in the school system and other kind of government and state sponsored sites. Please, yeah. You just brought up just like, you know, the, like a formalized language and then like an informal language. That kind of brings me back to like what Kula was talking about. That was like um, where there are like, you know, there's like Haitian Creole and I guess Nigerian Creole and, and you know, I guess Louisiana Creole. Like, how do you guys think there is like a way to either, well, I asked this question, like formalize it, but like, just the example you brought up with the ATM in Nigeria, how people don't understand how to use it. Like, is there, do you think that there is a process? Would there be a, better process of formalizing or how would we just move forward to kind of take all these dialects and sub-languages and different kind of even accents you could say and then kind of making it easier for the wider wider audience to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great question. Not really directly that anybody. Yeah. No, that's Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can only just think of that like this this act of documenting and recognition is the beginning of it. And I think 
part of legitimizing the languages is first like recognizing it as such and, and I don't know I, I, I imagine like that that's a lot of the work that cool is doing and others are around just like creating an archive of the language and, and, and stewarding it and, and, and having a dictionary or just all, all of this kind of groundwork that has to happen with activists, language activists like Kula and others is at least one way to start that process. I don't know, but I'm not a linguist or, or work with languages very deeply, so I can't really speak much to that. Probably say like just multiple, we're talking about data sets and who, what kind of data sets are being used to create. And part of it is imagining for, for the engineers to, from the very beginning, imagine all of those speakers as users of that technology and to having a, a capacious group of people that are designing it and thinking about those things rather than that being like, you know, here, this is design, like that chart that Cola had of language use and who, what languages Siri speaks in, like again, that power, so. Oh, disproportionate, yeah. yeah. And I was thinking about like, as you were talking, like how when you, you know, you put your thumbprint on your phone and they make you put your thumbprint like, 25 different directions because you're never going to hit it right on and thinking about recording where is in just so many like doing that very same thing kind of with with language as opposed to having the proper way that we all you can always tell when someone's talking to a machine on the phone right when you're like no you know and you're like and that's it's disciplining our speech right so instead of having to hit that for the machine the machine being able to listen to us better in all those different ways <laughs> um, any other questions? I think we're, we're coming up on time. I want to respect everyone's time. I have, I have one more thing to ask you, actually. Have you seen, there's an artwork by Sean Dockeray that has Siri, Alexa, Google Home talking to each other. I love it. I it's, haven't seen it. It's stunning because they will talk to each other. Like, you can start them off by saying, you know, something. And they'll listen to each other's responses and they'll just continue to spin out in nonsensical. But they will be listening to each other and sound like they're further in conversation for hours to each other. But then they can't hear your parents. They can't hear. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah yes. it's, it's stunning. So lots of words, mm. but a lot of nonsense. Mm. Go ahead. Um, first, thank you all for sharing so much. I appreciate it. Um, and I wanted to know, because what I've gathered from this is that a lot of, you know, the mistranslation, if you would say that, mistranslation from, like, you know, a person talking to, with, like, electronic is tone. And so I wonder, on the flip side of things, with how vocabulary works, and talking about A and B, um, and especially now that like A being very exploited by white people and non black people generally in like regular language or white people say period or like just other like things that are like mm -hmm. you know like classically A and B E, how I don't know if anyone knows or has studied this specifically, but um, just like what that looks like when you're looking at the study that like I'm walking a dog and like the what was it perplexity? Yes. That there was called perplexity. Um, like, if on the flip side, when white people use A, B, and talking to AI, like, or like making TikToks or something that is like so new and fresh, like, would that be captioned rather than a black person using A, B, B? I don't know if this is in anyone's purview, but it was just a thought that I could see. Yes, and as you were talking, I'm like, well, who's like, who's mining TikToks for the auditory <laughs> data? Because that's like, we are creating auditory data in all sorts of ways too, that we don't. I mean, that's why Google bought YouTube was so they could use it for all of this data that we're we're listening to. And yeah, they're, they're big. Their big sound archive audio set is primarily from YouTube, and because people cap, they don't. People label their videos so they so they can just search fireworks, grab a bunch of videos that have fireworks, jump thirty seconds into the video and just record that. You know, most of the times it's correct. They'll probably do some you know, afterwards, but that's essentially how how they do that. And I think about like when Twitter introduced Twitter Voice, how that was basically that's a data mining project internally. They they want to get more voice data 
people would self-caption or the tweets themselves would be captions for the voice. Um, it's definitely, I think, happening. It must be happening. It's, it's such a, I mean, the economics of it are, are such that it has to be happening. From my experience, I mean, I played with Google Speech API a lot yeah. for years, and uh, it's not transparent. So I have no access to. I have access to the API. I can control how accurate it wants to be, how inaccurate it wants to be, and that's essentially that's that's the opacity to it. So um, I I have no answer besides lots of trial and error. And um, language used on the internet translates. Um, language not used on the internet, not so much. Like that's a really rough mm -hmm. like response. <laughs> I think right. that, that's why the UN's talking about legislation of the data sets, exposure and transparency of the data sets. Like kind of the right to be sonically represented in AI speech is something that they started to work on. Um, I think. With that, we're going to close out the, the roundtable, but not but. And thank you all for being here. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.